I'm just so thrilled to have Ariola Akinrumare, CFO of Petrolon Energy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Miru, for having me over. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Petrolon has been a strong advocate for indigenous companies in Nigeria's oil and gas sector. How does this mission shape your approach to both existing projects and new acquisitions in the region? We have indeed been very staunch um, advocates of indigenous ownership um, in the Nigeria energy sector, not just the oil and gas sector. And um, this is foundational to how we approach business, both our current businesses and even the new acquisitions that um, we're bringing in. Now, our preferences for local contractors and vendors is deeply rooted in an intentionality to nurture local talent and to foster an enabling, an enabling um, ecosystem. Now, our commitment, because in some companies, they give um, certain cadres of um, transactions to local entrepreneurs. And then when it crosses a certain threshold, it goes to the international and global players. But we, irrespective of the costs of the transaction, the valuation of the transaction, our preference is always to the local vendor. Mm -hmm. And I would say this because it's, I mean, talk is cheap. For the past decade of our existence, we've actually intentionally um, gone after in the independent um, indigenous entities and supported them um, in, in as much, and usually the criteria is, does the leadership have the same ethos as the petrol loan um, leadership has in terms of excellence, integrity, responsiveness? Once we find that the leadership has the same similar ethos, we ensure that we are the forefront of promoting them. More often than not, the very first significant contracts that these vendors have come from Petralon. So we have a cadre of now thriving established, and I'm very proud of this, a cadre of now thriving established local vendors. And it's, it, it, it's synergistic, if you are, it's symbiotic at the end of the day. When we run our operations now, we have a level of operational efficiency, which many other players in the do in industry find um, a bit amazing. And what they don't understand is that a lot of effort has gone into building this relationship. So as we nurture them as we're coming up, they nurture us now. So even when we're talking about things like price points, fees, consultancy fees, contractual fees, Petrolon has the advantage of getting things at cuts through prices because I mean, we helped them when they were growing up, yeah. and so they help us now. Yeah. So it's been symbiotic, and um, that's that's basically our approach to it, and that's how we intend to continue in future acquisitions as well. How is Petrolon adapting its strategy to take advantage of Nigeria's new fiscal incentives for oil and gas development? Okay. So I wouldn't say that we have had to adapt our strategies. Our strategies remain the same. Um, we had a 10-year strategy which um, we basically ran through. I mean, we're 10 years now. And then in the last year, we had a strategy session for the next seven years to 2030, our seven year roadmap. And what I would say when I say that we did, we, we don't have to adapt it is that there was almost a pre-knowing of what changes, what shifts would come up in the regulatory, economic and fiscal landscape. If you were to look at our seven year roadmap, you would ask the question, do we, where, are we flies, do we, where we flies on the walls <laughs> when the president and his team were coming up with the fiscal policies that you're talking about? They align so perfectly with the plans that we have. Yeah. So again, let me put it in context. One of the plans that we have, which we have actually made quite significant headroom in achieving, uh, is to acquire two offshore assets, mm -hmm. deep offshore assets. And guess what? Let me just let me just tell you the two two of the most recent um, fiscal policies that were enacted and on, uh, and revealed uh, unveiled rather by the Ministry of Finance in October 2024. The first one is a value added tax modification order, and the second one is the um, notice of incentives for deep offshore producing for deep offshore producing oil and gas. I think I got that wrong. Can I just say it? Is, can I just say it? The notice of tax incentives for deep offshore oil and gas production. Now, for an entity that is planning to acquire and has made headroom into acquiring to deep offshore assets, you can imagine how 
when we heard of those enactments, it was with joy and, uh, and gladness. So we, we haven't had to adapt any of our strategies. Rather, and I will commend the federal government in this regard, because they also must have had foresight to have come up with those two incentives, those two fiscal policies at this time. It shows that they are also intentional about what they have said. They're putting their money where their mouth is in saying that they will support the oil and gas industry. So uh, I, I give them kudos as well. So again, no adaptation needed. The road, we simply, the road met us as, as we stepped out, so to say. And could you provide a quick update on the current status of the development of the Dawes Island field and what future plans you have to maximize its potential? Okay. So the Dawes Island field hmm, is, um, there's a model that we run at Petrolum um, with respect to the basket of opportunities that um, we encounter and um, the assets that we have in-house. We have the operated basket and we have the non-operated basket. And those Island happens to be um, quite important to us uh, when it comes to the operated basket. So when you ask the question, um, what the current status of develop development is, I have to take it from the start to where we currently are and then where we plan to be in, in, in the future. So the asset was awarded to us in 2021. From that period to date, what we have done is we've partnered with a company called Petrovision and um, they are front runners when it comes to seismic studies and similar subsurface studies. We partnered with them to do an asset re-evaluation exercise and um, when we got the result and the report of that very in-depth exercise, we then commenced with a first line maintenance um, program, campaign rather, on the existing well on Dawes Island, um, the, because there was a well that was existing on the asset mm -hmm. when it was awarded to us. And upon conclusion, again, of that first line maintenance, we then went on to test the well because we wanted to understand what was going on with that well. We also wanted to understand more about the subsurface um, on, on the asset. So upon um, producing that well, we were able to produce it to about 300 to 400 barrels a day, which we then evacuated exported and then um, paid royalties there on to the federal government. See how I'm being careful to say that we then paid royalties on it to, to the federal government. So with the information that we gleaned, the data that we gleaned from all those exercises, we then developed a roadmap for maximizing the potential of, of that particular asset, which runs into double digits, millions of barrels mm -hmm. in terms of recoverable reserves. So it's quite substantial. And what we're doing currently is, so we have a three-year, we have a three-year plan, a three-well, three-year plan, three for three. That's that's kind of what we're calling it. And as I speak to you, we have a dredging team on the assets, dredging the assets, prior to our rig coming in in December to commence a drilling program. So we're drilling a totally new well. Now the other well had 300 to 400 barrels of, of, of a day production. This particular one with the reservoirs that we have targeted. We're hoping to produce at least 2,000 barrels a day to 2,300 barrels a day to bring us a cumulative of about 2,700 barrels a day. Of course, with the other two assets that we're planning, the other two wells that we're planning to drill in 2025 to 2026, um, we're also looking at about 2,000 to 2,500 barrels from each one um, of those wells. So that's the plan going forward. But I'm going to say something now that has to do with the first question you asked, because like I said, uh, it's always good to, con to, you know, to put things in context. We engage the dredging company that is on site now is actually an indigenous entity. Mm -hmm. And for anybody in the oil and gas industry, they can tell you that dredging is a capital intensive exercise. And for that kind of um, transaction, most entities will look to a Chinese um, company or other global entities to conduct the dredging, pro to conduct the dredging program. But we have a local entity, an indigenous company, so to say. In fact, fun fact, the managing director of that entity, he and I went to university together, great effect. <laughs> and um, he then, he, he was a first, I, I think he had, he had a first class. May I take that again? Yes, sir. In fact, fun fact, the managing director of that dredging company, he and I were at university together, great effect. And um, if I remember correctly, he graduated with a first class 
and then went on to work with Shell. Can you see the alignment in value? Mm -hmm. There's excellence mm -hmm. and then there's owner mindedness. There's a, a type of innovation in the leadership of that entity. So that's just, I just felt, let me bring that in so that, you know, we can put that in context. So that's a plan for the future of Doors Island. Petron recently launched its Future Leaders program to foster talent in the STEM field. What specific skills and expertise do you hope to instill in participants and how can companies ensure that technical skills align with the needs of the industry? Okay, so for Petrolum, the Future Leaders Program, which we call the FLP, is, um, rep it represents our commitment to future energy leaders, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa as a whole. Um, we're specifically targeting emerging talent in the STEM field. So we're focused on courses such as geology and engineering. Now, you ask, what are the specific skills that um, we plan to, that we would like to um, instill in them? I would start by saying that there's something that we call our 10 principles. And we also just, in we, we call them the Petralon spirit. Why? Because for every single person that is a member of the Petralon team, you will see those um, traits in them. Um, it's being owner-minded, it's being responsive, it's having a spirit of excellence, it's being collaborative, it's being inclusive. Mm. Those are some of the traits. So it's not just about the skills. Mm. Um, so those are some of the traits that we hope to, those are some of the traits we actually look for in the participants before we bring them on board. And those are the traits that we want to encourage. We're also looking to build leadership and operational capacity. The FLP is very different from your standard scholarship program because if you listen to the kind of traits and skills that we're planning to inculcate in them, bring out of them, they are not things that you can gain through a scholarship program. The way the FLP runs is we selected six of the top schools in Nigeria, six of the top universities in Nigeria, and then looked for those candidates with a certain profile, mm -hmm. the traits I spoke about, and academic prowess as well. And we also looked at the girl child, Mm. So we also focus on the girl child and ensure that at the very least, we try to do one for one, like a zebra, a male and a female. Mm. And the plan is to support them with financial, um, it, from a financial point of view, but to go beyond that support to look at work placements, internships, so that they see representation. For example, I spent a lot of time sitting with the females on the team so that they could see what I hope is a strong female leadership in oil and gas. So we plan to place them in Petralon as interns as they grow and also in other entities, not necessarily producing perhaps even midstream, downstream, because you want them renewable entities um, that are like friends of the family to Petralon so that you have, so it's not just fossil fuel, it's green energy as well, it's gas as well. And gas is also in our future um, because you remember that I, when I was talking about the fiscal policies, I said that it's, it, it's um, strategic for us because, of course, in acquiring assets that are deep offshore, we're also looking at, um, at gas. And I, I know I'm segwaying back, but I'm, I'm going to arrive at the point I'm making because gas is very, Nigeria is very much a gas country. We have, I think, 206 trillion cubic feet of gas compared to about um, 37 billion barrels of crude. So Nigeria is essentially a gas um, country because it might seem strange when I say engineering because one of the engineering um, fields that we have gone into specifically has to do with gas. Mm -hmm. So we're not just looking at students who are studying mechanical engineering or petroleum engineering. We're looking specifically at children, students who are studying gas. Mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, studies that have to do with gas because that aligns with our own pipeline mm -hmm. of um, assets as well that are in our future. So in a nutshell, our focus is in developing a pipeline of future-ready energy leaders who can then navigate and lead through the complexities of global energy transition. So ultimately, the Future Leaders Program is about creating long-lasting impact, but not just within Petroleum, not, not just within Nigeria, but be within Africa, and maybe I should say even beyond the shores of Africa. And just my final question, what key outcomes is Petroleum aiming to achieve at African Energy Week this year? Mm -hmm. So the theme for Africa Energy Week 2024 is energy growth to an enabling environment, right? 
And um, in our tent year, this is our tent year at Petrol Loan, and I'm sure I've mentioned that like a billion times in the course of this conversation. But in this attempt here, we have chosen to be diamond sponsors at Africa Energy Week. Um, in previous years, we have simply been participants. And um, it's because we have now observed that um, African Energy Week is a platform that will be pivotal in shaping the energy future of Africa. And with that in mind, what we aim and hope and intend to achieve in this year's AEW are workable, practical strategies and solutions mm. to the peculiar and unique energy issues of Africa, such as energy security, solutions that are scalable, solutions that are sustainable. Um, those are, that's what we, we, we hope to achieve in terms of, and we'll be very much engaged and involved in the discourses, in the discussions um, that will be had in, in coming out with those solutions and strategies. The other thing we would like to achieve is collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ethos of Petralon, one of the I, one of the traits of the Petralonian, uh, the Petralon spirit is collaboration. We don't believe in silos, and we believe very much in sustainable partnerships. You would have heard that in my talk about FLP, in my talk in, in my conversation about indigenous players. So it's a beautiful place to have everybody in the room, so to say. And we're hoping to not only just network for the sake of networking. We're hoping to have to, to, to in a year's time say that this collaborative partnership we had was seeded at Africa Energy Week. So we look forward to engaging with industry leaders. We look forward to engaging with potential partners. We look forward to collaborative opportunities that can accelerate the adoption of advanced technologies and also just foster the growth of energy in Nigeria. And I'm going to close on this note. I, I want to quote our own say. Um, who is the CEO and founder of um, Petralon, he always says that the energy sector is Africa's most transformative lever. And this is something that we strongly believe. So we're hoping that in sitting down with the brilliant minds at AEW, we will change the future of energy in mm -hmm. Africa together. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. It has been a pleasure to meet with you today. Thank you. <laughs>